This episode is sponsored by Roland and Boss, the world's leaders in electronic musical instruments. And by Universal Audio, pioneering audio recording for more than 60 years. Welcome to the digital airways of Stereophonic, an ongoing conversation series presenting the people, personalities, and perspectives of the modern music business. I'm Dan Kimpel. With our fourth season, we continue to introduce you to those in the spotlight and behind the scenes, and all of our Stereophonic subjects are right here with us in person. It is our objective to entertain and inform you as we reveal tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. Even if you don't know his name, you've heard Danny Korchmar's magical guitar on tracks with artists including Linda Ronstadt, Bob Dylan, Carole King, and Stevie Nicks. He's written songs for and or with Don Henley, Jackson Brown, and James Taylor, and produced projects with artists like Billy Joel and Neil Young. We're influenced by everything around us, everything that's happening. And that's what should happen if you're a songwriter and a musician. You should be paying attention to what's going on around you. And then the, the cadence of the way people speak, um, stuff you hear in movies, the way people walk down the street, their physical attitude. I think uh, to be a good musician, you've got to be uh, aware of all this stuff. It, it all has to come into you. And then it will influence what you play and how you play and certainly what you write. Danny Korchmar is plugged in on Stereophonic. Hello, Storiophonic Universe. We are on the road with the Storiophonic crew. We're in beautiful Marina del Rey, California, where we can feel those bucolic ocean breezes sweeping over us. Hey, Danny. Hi, how you doing? Danny, you're wearing a t-shirt that says Immediate Family. That's and right. That is a wonderful band that you are playing with right now. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about who you were with in Immediate right. Family? Well, Immediate Family is uh, basically, it's myself, Wadi Wachtel, Lee Sklar, Russ Kunkel, and Steve Postel. And um, it's amazing to be playing with these fellas because I've been playing with, well, four of them anyway, for basically my whole life. So I've been playing with Russ and Lee for 50 years. We started a long time ago playing with James Taylor and done all kinds of things together. And here we are in a rock and roll band continuing and playing some more. So it's really quite a thrill. We love each other. We are a family. So it's a brilliant situation. In researching you, I had to go through my own files, and uh, your name came up a number of times. Mm. It came up because we have interviewed Leland Sklar. He was our guest right. here. It mm -hmm. also came up uh, in an interview we did with Peter Asher. Mm -hmm. And again, that part of that whole incredible coterie of people, that it's so great that that sustains itself now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you play dates here. You're going to be doing some dates in New York. And also, Japan is a big market. What is it about the Japanese audiences? I'm not sure, but they sure do appreciate American music, and uh, they're very enthusiastic um, and we're, we're always thrilled to go there. They love us, and they know us, and they know all about our history, and we have a great time there. I'm not sure what it is about Japanese people that that's the case, but it is. It's always interesting to be in Japan and see kind of what filters through. You know, there's this erroneous thought that they love everything American musically, but, but there's certain things that they really do love musically. Jazz has typically been a thing, and there just seems to be, uh, you know, a lot of reverence for the instrumental world over there, mm -hmm. you know. Well, that's because there's no language, is there? There's, uh, it's uh, the universal language. Music is the universal language. Thank God. So that's why jazz is so popular. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Danny, you know, it's so interesting to identify you with the hyphenate that we use because it's different. Not everybody writes songs by themselves that major singer-songwriters record. I think that that's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. You came out to Los Angeles at a time when there was a diametric shift. You were from New York. The pop music world was moving definitely westward. Did you feel that at the time? That was the case, of course. Yeah. But uh, at the time, I was just sick of being in Manhattan. I was sick of New York City. Um, and it was cold. And there was, the gigs were running out. And um, you know, I was in a couple of bands in New York, and we had a lot of fun. But after a while, it got to be a real grind. So when I had an offer to come out to L.A. with a rock band, a band called Clear Light, they needed a guitar player, and uh, I signed up with them. I was glad to get out of Manhattan, go someplace where it's nice and warm. And when I got there, I realized all hell was breaking loose in music. 
Yeah. And it was um, basically Action Central West. Tons of musicians were there. Everybody was playing. It was a very different scene than New York, not as claustrophobic and, and more open and more accepting of everything, of all kinds of music and all kinds of musicians. And the musicians were all wonderful to each other. Everyone was very generous mm. uh, in, in all kinds of ways. So it was, it was a great scene that I just walked right into. That said, your Manhattan background certainly gave you access to see a lot of different kinds of music, Oh, right? boy. Did, yeah, did yeah. it ever, yes. Yeah, I read Dave Van Ronk was somebody that you, you got to witness. I was incredibly lucky, actually, to have been... Uh, around right at the right time in New York. You couldn't, it was just a gold mine, a cultural gold mine. And me and my buddies used to go into the city and we, we saw every kind of music. We'd walk into like the half note and there's the original Coltrane Quartet. Just walk right in and there they are, the original band, tearing it up. And um, then we'd go, you know, into the village and see Dave Van Rock. We saw Cecil Taylor, the avant-garde piano player. We saw Lightning Hopkins and Muddy Waters and Latin music, Eddie Palmieri Orchestra at the Village Gate every Monday night. It was just unbelievable. It was a, an incredible, uh, just an ocean of, of wonderfulness, <laughs> of all kinds of music. I saw the Beatles at uh, Carnegie Hall, me and my buddies. I heard that they were playing there on the radio. I called Carnegie Hall, and sure enough, tickets were available. <laughs> and there we were, you know. And you could do that back then. Now, of course, forget it. You can't, you know, all the people I just mentioned, you could, you could never get in to see them uh, if they were around now. Well, I look at your early credits. One, I see a band. You mentioned Clearlight, which I knew. And also, you were, I believe you were aligned at one point with The Fugs. Yeah, that that's correct? right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I was in a band with James Taylor called The Flying Machine. And when that band broke up, uh, I was looking for work. I wanted, to, you know, I wanted to play. And I knew they were hiring a bunch of us in the, in the village, a bunch of us musicians uh, signed on with The Fugs to kind of back them up. Because they were paying. They were paying something like $100 a week, which was great, you know. And uh, they were hilarious guys. Musically, it wasn't much. It was, you know, more of a, uh, a theatrical presentation than a, than a musical endeavor. But it was fun to do for a minute. And that's what it was. I was with them maybe three or four months. Was the session scene a whole different kind of dynamic in New York when yeah, you were there? Yeah, I think it was. Well, yeah. certainly when I was there. Yeah, it was a closed thing. Yeah. And uh, there was guys that did it, and that was it. It was just a few people. Well, a, you know, a handful of guys that did everything. And uh, it was a closed situation. And when I went to L.A., I realized it was much more open. But I was very fortunate in that uh, I'd already started playing with Carol King, playing on yeah. her demos. Mm -hmm. And Carol, she's a genius, more than just as a songwriter, as a producer and arranger. She's an absolute genius. And uh, that's how I, basically how I learned to play songs on records. How yeah. I learned to play on records was, was working with her. Cool, and you have a band with her as well called The City. Heidi Ho, Heidi High, which we knew later from Blood, Sweat, and Tears that's was, right. was yeah. done. A version of Wasn't Born to Follow, I believe. That was the, one of the, the first demos I played on was Wasn't Born to Follow. Very different than the way the birds end up doing it. Yeah. But uh, that was, I think, one of the first demos I did with Carol and Jerry. Yeah. It was so interesting because Carol and Jerry had the huge history. But Carol was so young still at that point in time, even though she had written all of those earlier pop hits that we knew. That's right. You know, it's, it's interesting to hear that. You were involved in a project that Jerry and Carol did together as well um, called Head. Mm -hmm. uh, you played on the Porpoise song, I believe. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I played on a couple of tunes for that uh, soundtrack, and yeah. I got to meet a lot of people there. Uh, Jack Nietzsche was the um, arranger. Jack was a wonderful guy and an incredible talent. I was really thrilled to meet him and work with him. And I also played on a track called As We Go Along that's on the album, and there was three guitar players on that track. There's N Neil, uh, Ry Cooter, and myself. Wow. Jack Nicholson was involved in that. That was with That's the right. monkeys. That's right. I met Jack, yeah. Yeah, and it just it sounds like a really a magical time here in Los Angeles. It really was. You yeah. Know, um, everyone knew everyone else and it was really everyone was very uh, open, friendly and, and uh, encouraging. It was an incredible scene going on. Everyone was out to help everyone else. It was just great. Were you identifying yourself at that point as a songwriter as well as a guitar player? Or? I don't know what I was. <laughs> <You know? laughs> You know, I was doing it all. I wasn't identifying myself as anything. I was just <laughs> wanted to play and write and and hang out with my friends and just be in music all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you sang lead on a track as well on the City Project. I yeah, know. that was yeah. Carol's idea. Yeah, uh, and uh, I never really was that get comfortable at that point, but um, that was Carol's that wanted me to do it. So of course I did. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's it's just it was interesting to see. Uh, 
that you worked with her, I mean, because obviously you became, your, your chops as a songwriter increased and we became more aware of you, even though you had done that earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when people get pigeonholed into one groove, you know, we tend to think of them as a musician or as a musical director. Mm-hmm. But it, and even, as you said, you never seemed inhibited by, by those limitations. No, it never occurred to me. I just did everything I could do, you know, played with everyone I could play with. I was always writing and... Uh, I wasn't thinking about it that much, about what my place was or what the name of it was or how to categorize myself. I just wanted to be in in the game. Yeah. When you hit town running, what part of town did you live in when you got to Los Angeles? Um, Laurel Canyon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And was it was it everything that we hear? Yes, it was. Wow. Mm-hmm. Everyone was writing songs and playing and, and producing and recording, and it was a really great open situation. Mm-hmm. You had met James Taylor when you were both teenagers. I That's right, yeah. Correct. Uh, was it uh, on a vacation home? Well, his family and my family used to go up to Martha's Vineyard every summer. Yeah. Now, at the time, Martha's Vineyard was kind of a middle-class getaway. Now, it's only for zillionaires. But at the time, it was a, uh, a place you could go and rent a house for seven, $800 for the entire summer. And that's what my family used to do. And James's family, actually, they owned a house up there. They were smart enough to buy a place. So James and I met each other just hanging out, just, you know, like kids do. Yeah. I, I think I was 14, I think he was 13, something like that. Then we started hanging out together. Was he playing music at that point? Uh, he was just starting to play music, mm-hmm. and um, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't really proficient on the guitar yet, but uh, he, got, he got there very quickly. There was one summer he was playing, it was, it was, just, it was, it was okay. He came back the next summer and, and basically had his, the style you hear now, basically in place obviously he grew upon and expanded on it but he uh within the space of a year he basically taught himself how to play james taylor style guitar which is an amazing an amazing style of guitar oh, he's and brilliant he's amazingly brilliant leland sklar has referenced that i think is a following james's thumb or That's something right. you yeah, know because so. james is yeah. the way he would do it is his thumb would play the bass parts and his hand would play the uh kind of the harmony parts and it was a built-in arrangement almost listening to him yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, we, you know, we interviewed Peter Asher. We spoke about uh, obviously signing James Taylor to Apple Records right. and then James not having a manager at a certain point and then coming to Los Angeles and doing management. Right. So you re- obviously reconnected with James when he moved back here to L.A. from England. Well, I don't think he ever really moved here. He was here for a while oh, uh, to make Sweet Baby James. Yeah. He was never crazy about Los Angeles then or now, I'm sure. <laughs> It's an acquired taste, huh? Dig it. Yeah. I dig it. The sound of the the studio recordings at a certain time in Los Angeles had so much air in them. You know, mm. people weren't overplaying. I think there was a lot of breathing of the instruments. Well, for instance, on "Sweet Baby James," Peter was uh, wise enough to get make it very spare, take out everything, yeah. feature James's guitar, and minimal accompaniment, which worked. The the album he did with Apple was too much stuff, a lot of yeah. stuff going on, and it didn't work as much, but. Once he got everything out of the way, it made it real spare. Then James came through, and that's when uh, people started to recognize how great he was. You did the touring thing as well. As the touring has been a big part of, of your career. Do you enjoy that now, or did you enjoy it then? Well, the last big tour I did was uh, the Troubadour reunion tour with yes. James and Carol, and we all loved that. It was just great. Leland, I remember Leland saying, well, let's just do this the rest of our lives. <laughs> we all felt that way. It was just an incredible joy. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it probably wasn't vans and having to carry your own gear, huh? Not so much, no. <laughs> no, no. There's a song I wanted to ask you about. It's called Chump Change Romeo. Mm-hmm. It was recorded by Rick Nelson. That's right, yeah. You wrote that song, right? Yes. Uh-huh. How did you know Rick Nelson? How did you intersect with I him? I actually have never met, I never did get to meet Rick Nelson. I was in a band called Attitudes. Uh-huh. Attitudes we had a lot of fun in that band. It was a fellow named Paul Stallworth, a brilliant bass player, and uh, Jimmy Keltner, of course. Mm-hmm. And David Foster. Yeah. And we had a great time together. And so I was coming up with stuff that I thought would be fun for the band to play. That was really all I thought about. So uh, I came up with that tune. It's kind of a silly, more not kind of, it's a silly song. <laughs> but uh, I was really thrilled that, that Rick Nelson recorded it. And uh, it was just a lucky streak. It's got a great title. Mm-hmm. So you worked with Foster in that period of time. I mean, Foster had come here with Skylark, with his band from That's Canada, right, yes. got mm-hmm. all their gear ripped off very famously in their mm-hmm. car in Highland Avenue. But did he have the qualities that looked like he was going to move into production at that time? Well, there was no question he was going to be he was going to make it. I remember yeah. telling him that. He was playing in the pit band of the Rocky Horror Show at the Roxy Theater. And I guess his car broke down or something, and I had to drive him to work. So I was driving him to work. 
And I told him, I said, man, a year from now, you're going to have to hire someone to answer the phone. You're going to be so happening. And I, he was just obviously going to make it. Yeah. He was great. I mean, a really great musician, first class. He had a great feel. He was just one of those cats that you just knew was going to be successful. There's no way he wasn't going to make it. And of course, he did. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Rocky Horror Picture Show. You played on the soundtrack of that, did you? I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw that. A producer I wanted to ask you about, because I've never really asked anybody about this, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm curious as to what the, the production mode was. I was working with Lou Adler, mm -hmm. you know. What do you remember about the way that he produced records? Well, uh, Lou uh, produced uh, the, the first album I played on all the way through, which was The City. Yes. And uh, he was just the coolest cat ever, you know. He, he would just say a few words to everybody and do a few things, and uh, suddenly you'd go into the, the playback, listen to the playback, and it would sound great, just absolutely great. I couldn't believe it. I was thrilled to death. This is my first big experience. Lou was just such a cool cat. He was so calm. He was so chill. He knew exactly what to say and what not to say. He didn't speak too much. A lot of producers run their mouth too much. If you've hired great guys, you don't need to say much, you know. And Lou knew that. A great experience working with him. Yeah. Where did you record the City album? Where? Yeah. Oh, man. It was a studio on uh, Selma and Coenga or something. Uh huh. I can't remember the name of it. It was around the corner from Capitol Records. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We were talking earlier at that point in time, the recording studios, there were, there were huge recording studios in Hollywood. Over time, things have shifted to people doing home recordings or doing them track by track by track by track. Yeah. A lot of people think when doing that individual thing takes away a lot of the soul of the music. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's nothing like being in a, in a room with four or five guys because uh, you're playing off each other. And uh, as opposed to doing a piecemeal, one guy at a time, there's no uh, communication. There's stuff that happens in the room when you're playing off of each other that is, it's just not going to happen when everyone's overdubbing. There's also the air that happens in a room, the ambience mm -hmm. of everyone in the room together. And that also adds to the sound and to the overall uh, vibe of a record. Of course, now everyone is missing that because we've had 20 years of, of uh, everyone making records on their laptop in their bedroom. Yeah. And now we're hoping, I'm hoping for sure, that younger bands and younger artists uh, rediscovered going into the studio with the band and playing live and doing it, reminding them what music is. I'm hoping that'll come back. Everything does come back, you know. Uh, recording in general, uh, making records and recording music, is like it's on a pendulum. It swings one way and swings the other way. It goes from, uh, uh, you know, from one style to another. We had um, disco that's very slick music, and, mm -hmm. and along came punk and new wave, the opposite of it. And this seems to happen all the time. Yeah. And I'm hoping it continues to happen because that's what makes American music interesting. Speaking of interesting, before we went on, Mike, we, we spoke a little bit about the uh, documentary about Linda Ronstadt. Mm -hmm. It's an artist with whom you share a lot of history. Mm. Um, when we interviewed Peter Asher, one of the interesting things he said was that pop music was not her wheelhouse. You know, the Mexican music and the standard music was more her wheelhouse. Pop was sort of the aberration within, mm -hmm. within her artistry, and I, I found that a really interesting mm. perspective. She seemed to know exactly what she wanted. Oh, boy, did she ever. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Linda absolutely knew what she wanted to do. She yeah. knew how to pick songs. Very, very intelligent person. Mm -hmm. And uh, she knew what songs that would fit her voice. And although Peter may be right about uh, what her wheelhouse is, when I played with her, her wheelhouse was definitely rock. And yeah. She was one of the greatest, I would say the greatest singer I've ever worked with, really, that, that I've ever been on stage with. Not to take away from James or, or Jackson, yeah. but as just for a full-on singer, she was just amazing. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I went to... Um, when I got the gig, Peter called me and asked me what I would be interested in touring with Ronstadt, and I said, absolutely. So uh, I learned the songs, and I went to the first rehearsal, and she, we go into uh, It's So Easy to Fall in Love. When she hit that, it was like a knife going through my head. It was so intense. I, I flipped. I said, wow, dig this. I get to play this. So I went to my amps and turned up. Because <laughs> I said, you know, now I can really blast away, because she was really so powerful and so intense. I've never heard anything like it. And don't expect to ever again either. She's really, she was really in a class by herself. Yeah. The movie gets that rock thing. And, and women weren't rocking in that era well, necessarily. Well, she's full-on badass. Yeah, yeah. I loved playing with her. You mentioned Jackson Brown. Uh -huh. uh, a couple years ago, he did a free show. I live near Highland Park. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he has history in that neighborhood. And mm -hmm. did a free show in Sycamore Park. And I was in the moment of thinking, you know, most people can't like walk down the street to their local park and see Jackson Brown perform. This mm -hmm. is 
an incredible mitzvah. You know yeah. what I mean? You're right. What a wonderful energy. Mm-hmm. You know, at the time, I think about the eras when you worked with him uh, and the touring and how the touring influenced the recording as well. Mm-hmm. Those must have been very fun tours, or were they really grind tours? Well, I loved it. You know, I loved yeah. touring, and uh, I had a ball out there. Yeah, the, it, they are a grind, yeah. uh, but not because of the music. And it's, it's a cliche to say that mm-hmm. the, the hard part is the travel. Yeah. That, and if that's what you get paid for. You don't get paid for the two hours you're on stage. You get paid for the other 22 hours. When you're in a bus or in a hotel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting in that period of time, he would write a song called The Loadout, where he right. would focus on on the roadies, which That's is right. something you just didn't hear that. No. You know? Well, he decided that Running on Empty was going to be about being on the road. Yeah. That all the songs were going to be of a piece of, about the experience of being on the road with the band. Yeah. And he did it. It's an album with an arc, with a story arc, a narrative arc. And there were albums, I mean, there were a lot of more albums, I think, kind of focused in the album world as opposed to the singles world where you can right. sustain a narrative art. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes. There's a piece of the puzzle. We're talking about, about analog sense again, things that come around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I interview producers now who are, you know, in the early 20s and they're ranting and raving about the power of the Juno 6 or, right. um, you know, just differences. DX7 mm-hmm. uh, is something that figures into your songwriting, correct? Yes, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we had heard about the DX7. I was working with Henley at the time, and we were working with guys from Toto, so Steve Bricaro and David Page. And I think it was Steve that said, was started telling us about this new Yamaha synthesizer that was going to be the bomb, and it was great. So uh, Don turns to his aide-de-camp, Tony Tavey, and he says, Tony, get one. <laughs> Two days later, we had the first DX7, you know, and uh, stuff like that. That was one of the joys of work, <laughs> working with Henley. <laughs> Is whatever piece of gear we wanted, it just would appear. Yeah. And even if no one else had one, we had one of the first drum machines, Lynn drum machines. We had maybe the first DX7. And that's what I used on um, on All She Wants to Do is Dance um, to make that sound that you hear that goes all the way through the tune. And you wrote that song by yourself. Yeah. That's a solo write. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got that Fitzgerald thing to it of... Right. There's all kinds of riotous guerrilla action going on, but, right. but we're just hitting your hammer. Yes, there's down. there's a little Tom and Daisy Buchanan in that song for love sure. Love it. Yeah. yeah, and it holds up. It holds up beautifully. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad you think so. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Another keyboard which kind of predates that. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I believe is part of, of your history. The mm-hmm. the mighty Farfisa organ. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, well, we did dirty laundry with that. That's great. I wrote it on our Farfisa organ, and uh, it was really. Uh, yeah, I ran it through an, an echoplex and got that delay, and that's what you hear on the record. It's possible to take very low-fi kinds of equipment because the Farfisa is yep. it's pretty low-fi stuff, yep. mm-hmm. you know, and do interesting things with it. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. Henley and I used to use the Farfisa. We used to use cheap Casio uh, keyboards, those little t- toy Casios. Yeah. We used to use all that stuff. I remember giving uh, the, the little Casio keyboard to Ben Montanch and say, here, play this. And he goes, oh, do I have to? It's this dinky little thing. But... You know, Ben might be in the great musician he is. He, he got stuff out of it. What is your facility as a keyboard player? I can play in one key, basically, uh-huh. or in one or two keys, and very limited. But you seem to know what it's supposed to do. Well, I, I was able yeah. to write songs on it yeah. uh, using what little knowledge I had on it, and, and uh, you know, very simple kind of music that I was able to put together on it. Some of it wasn't that simple. Some of it was kind of complex, yeah. but uh, I had a lot of fun with it and wrote some great stuff with Henley on it used it for you know stuff that was that uh, henley uh wrote to i made tracks on it and then henley would write to the tracks and i did that a lot okay so you were you were cre- creating the tracks and then he would re- yeah. did, did you also write in the room with henley as well or? uh yeah sometimes yeah. but um you know if i'd come up with the track that he would listen and he goes well i can write to that so then we go uh-huh. in the studio and and we'd uh, start recording it he would then take it and maybe drive around in his car and listen to it and, and a few days later or a month later or six months later he'd come back with the lyrics so yeah i've had songwriters tell me that sometimes it's advantageous for them to write on an instrument with with they have less facility because mm-hmm. they might hit something by accident well i think that's true and that's definitely yeah. the case with me and, and keyboards absolutely yeah so that that's a good point yeah yeah we, we've got some great guitars around here in the room though but you don't you mentioned that you don't have a gazillion guitars no i don't <laughs> you know is that a conscious uh, conscious thought to pare things down? Yes, it is. Uh-huh. I yeah. got rid of a lot of stuff because I just it wasn't I wasn't playing it. Yeah. So I wanted the guitars to go where they'd be played. I just have the guitars that I actually use uh, left. This yeah. is some of them, but I have a lot more. Cool. Several more. Yeah, I'm looking at the, the Epiphone. The Epiphone right here. Yes, that's the John Lennon 
Epiphone Casino. That is a beautiful instrument. It is. I love that guitar. Yeah. I came across an old list from back in the day where you were talking about some various guitar players that, that you admired. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph Spence was one of them. Oh, it's phenomenal. Yeah. James and I used to listen to his album, Bahamian Folk Guitar. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. It's just like, this guy's from a different planet. Fantastic stuff. He had a thing where he would like kind of vocalize as he would play. Yeah, he would one. kind of hum, hum along. It was great stuff. I still listen to that album. Steve Cropper was somebody, I believe, that you were like Yeah, to. Steve Cropper was one of my main influences. I was heavy into soul music. Yeah. And a lot of my main influences were, were soul guitar players, Steve Cropper being the primary among them, but also Curtis Mayfield, yeah. Skip Pitts, mm -hmm. um, uh, Teeny Hodges, um, these kind of cats, you know. And when I was a kid, I just loved all those Stax Volt records. I bought all of the albums, all of them. And uh, I it was imitating, I learned to play basically by imitating Steve a lot. And then, uh, or also Curtis Mayfield, like I said. Yeah. People, you know, but I, I love that stuff. But I was, you know, I loved that. I also loved rock and roll, straight ahead rock and roll. I loved blues, like Lightning Hopkins, mm -hmm. Muddy Waters, those cats. So it was all those things that kind of came together in, in, uh, in my style. Did you study formally? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I did, yeah. Like you go to a teacher? Sorry, or... go to a private teacher uh -huh. in, in New York. I, yeah. I was... Uh, I was in uh, Westchester County outside of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I would uh, go into the city a couple of times a week and study with a really terrific uh, guitar teacher who also taught me basic theory, what was called applied theory, mm -hmm. which is inc absolutely invaluable to me when I started doing dates and, and having to learn songs quickly. Yeah. So you read, you obviously read music. Not that much anymore. I used to be able to sight read pretty uh -huh. well, but I was never called upon to do that once I got right. here. They'd give you a rhythm chart, which is basically chords, and uh, you were... Uh, supposed to make up your own part, come up with a part, which I was, I didn't. We all did that, and we were, we got very good at it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, coming up with stuff that worked for the song, and that's what you get hired for. You were here there, as you mentioned, kind of at the change of music, and musically that that went from, you know, a group of players we knew as as the Wrecking Crew mm -hmm. uh, into the Section, which is mm -hmm. your era of that. Mm -hmm. The Wrecking Crew elements were were sort of like that as well, but they were still very active. When you got here, right? Those players? Uh, yes, to some degree. They, uh -huh. they, were, they were active. And of course, they were, those guys were all legendary. They were all brilliant musicians. Yeah. And uh, we got just the, the kind of end taste of them. Leland worked with those fellows more than I did, absolutely. Yeah. But they were great. We all admired them tremendously. Still do. When I read the number of sessions they did, it's just staggering. They were, they were four session a day people. That's and, right. You know? Mm -hmm. That's right. And of course, Phil Spector had to use like, 70, 80 musicians on a, spa, on a session. I don't so think I don't, that many, but a lot. <laughs> a lot. Two or three piano players, four guitar players, two bass players. It was great, you know, great yeah. stuff. You've worked so much, and you work now with Wadi, uh, Wadi Watel. How do you divide the guitar chores with Wadi Watel? Well, that's interesting because uh, he and I really have different approaches on guitar. Yeah. We both play real loud. Which is <laughs> so that's our, you know, that's the, uh, in our band we do anyway. Um, but we have a very different approach. And um, with Wadi and I, we very rarely, there's, there's not a lot of conversation. We just go. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, he and I just hit, we just have always been able to find, uh, been able to play with each other very easily without any discussion about it. The most conversation we have, for instance, uh, is that you go high and I'll go low. That would be a long conversation, you know, about what we're going to do on a particular tune. He listens to me, I listen to him, and it comes together very quickly. It's just magic. I, I'm not sure. I, I can't uh, explain to you exactly how uh, that works. It just does, and it always has. Wad and I just are, we're able to play together. We just, we just fall in. That's really uh, terrific. It's probably because our styles are different, and we know how to meld them into a, a sound. Yeah. And we're still doing it. Candace Springs did a version of New York Minute. The song New York. I don't know who that is. Larry Klein produced it. It was on an album for Lang Lang. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting song. Yeah, it is. You know, where did the title come from? Well, I, it was Henley's idea. New uh, York Minute. I want to write a song called New York Minute, and I want to try to capture some essence of uh, New York. So I went home and I was screwing around on the piano, came up with the changes, and uh, the chorus. You know, I started singing the chorus to him. The, the changes in the chorus. He went, "Okay, great." He took all that, and then we. Uh, we got Jay Wendy again to help us with the bridge. Yeah. And uh, then Don wrote those great lyrics, and those are some great lyrics, some of the best lyrics he's ever written, I think. Yeah. And that song, I'm very, very proud of, of that song and the way it came out. 
Yeah, it's it's very evocative of of that experience. Yes, yeah, it you works. Know, and yeah. everything can change. And what can you say to that? Don Henley is certainly one of the most distinctive and incredible vocalists in the history of our business. I well, think. I agree with you. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know what his technique is, but it just it's so effective against that type of music. Yeah. Well, he came up. He came up uh, playing and singing in in uh, rhythm and blues bands. Yeah. So, and so he knew that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that R and B thing. It's interesting. You know, players like yourself, or we don't necessarily think of necessarily as R and B players, but we're so seriously influenced by listening to R and B music. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know. So I think, and you get that in country music too. That's but, right. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it's a very, very close, close thing. Yeah. Um, we talked about the Wrecking Crew, and we mentioned uh, uh, that they have made a film of the Wrecking Crew. Right. Um, Denny Tedesco, yes. whose father, uh, Tommy Tedesco, the was great Tommy Tedesco. one of the members of the Wrecking Crew. That's correct. And uh, it took him a long time to get the film together because there was so much music to clear. And That's I, right. I, I remember that was a part of that reality because I saw an early cut of it and then it was a, a long time before i saw but that's the way films take a long time to make and right. those of us know mm-hmm. so do we understand that there uh, there's a, a movie being made uh, another denny tedesco movie well yeah uh denny is doing a documentary on us immediate family our yeah. band which goes all the way back to uh when we started playing together it includes the section of course and then up to the present and of course we're still playing we're still rocking yeah so um it's, it's a hell of a story i'm thrilled that denny wants to tell that story it's just great you know we've got a lot of people on board a lot of the people we played with are going to be on board talking about us so, with so much interest now in music intensive films and i think because the um you know the method of getting films out is different than it used to be mm-hmm. i mean uh, there's independent roots there's there's netflix things there's hulu things there's i think it's a wonderful time to witness the history and the present of our music simply through the cinema arts right you know yeah, there's a tremendous interest in, in that period of time, yeah. late 60s, early 70s, and on up. You know, there's, a, a, there's a tons of books, there's tons of documentaries right now. There's, what, you know, there's Linda's, there's Crosby's, there's uh, Echoes in the Canyon yeah. that Andy Slater did. There's mm-hmm. uh, um, all this stuff, and uh, I guess ours will be kind of in that league. But there's a lot of interest in that period of time in music because that was a terribly exciting period of time. Unfortunately, right now, music is not that important um, as socially as it was then. This is true. You look great. You're a great looking guy. Yeah. Obviously, there were, there were a number of, of people that, that didn't have the same experience through that period of time because there was other elements, but some people were able to like avoid those elements of the life, mm-hmm. the potions, the powders, the tequila. Well, just good genes, I guess. But uh, we were all toasting at one point, you know, in the, in the 70s and stuff, but... Uh, I think it was um, ultimately the fact that I'm, you know, a nice Jewish boy, and I got guilty. I was guilty about getting too high, and ultimately the guilt caused me to to uh, slow down and then stop altogether. That's a good thing. Having said that, I still enjoy a good martini. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're in, in your home, and I'm trying not to gape at things, but you have an interest in visual art, I believe. Is that sure. correct? Yeah, mm-hmm. to some degree. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Does that influence you musically? I don't know about that. I, everything influences me musically. Uh, certainly, uh, all the, I'm, I'm a big movie buff, and. Uh, so I'm influenced there. And this is true of all of us. We're influenced by everything around us, everything that's happening. And that's what should happen. If you're a songwriter and a musician, you should be paying attention to what's going on around you. And then the, the cadence of the way people speak, um, stuff you hear in movies, the way people walk down the street, their physical attitude. I think uh, to be a good musician, you've got to be uh, aware of all this stuff. It all has to come into you. And then it will influence what you play and how you play and certainly what you write. As a songwriter, you're a storyteller. Was your mom an influence on that? Because I know she's a novelist. Yeah, my mother was an influence, but she was a, a real intellectual. Yeah. Not a, uh, you know, that word has, doesn't have as much meaning like a lot of words now, but she was the real deal. She had been educated in Moscow. She came from Moscow. But she was also the least snobbish person ever. She had no attitude at all, but she was very, very brilliant. And uh, yeah, she was a big influence on me, certainly. Encourage you to read, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Well, everyone was reading. Everyone I knew was, you know, there was tons of books in our house. and So uh, it was just a natural thing, yeah. Yeah. You read now? Yeah, all the time. Looks like it. Yeah, sure. Lots of books around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And art books and just different elements of it. Mm-hmm. We think of you musically, the Telecaster, that was the sound that I sort of identified with you. I started with the Telecaster, and that was my main axe for a long time. Yeah. I got to a Telecaster because, as I said, Steve Cropper was my hero, and he played a Telecaster, so I wanted to sound just like him. But at one point, I was playing Les Pauls for a while, played Stratocasters for a minute, 
I'd always go back to the the uh, the Telecaster though, and I still have a bunch of them, three or four of them. But at the moment, I'm playing this GNL guitar here, mm-hmm. and that's my main axe because it's so comfortable and it feels so great, and you can really get around on it. It's very unadorned in a way, you know, yeah, like it's just right. just like very straight ahead. You weren't really a pedal guy either, huh? Uh, it's funny you say that. Um, <laughs> Because Waddy hates pedals, and he, you know, he always makes fun of you if you bring pedals on stage. He goes, "What do you need that for?" And uh, after a while, I got sick of using them, and I took them off. With my band, um, I, I don't need pedals very much at all, and don't don't use them. So uh, at this point, I'm not using any pedals on stage, um, except for one tune we do, "Dirty Laundry." I need to get that delay like like is on the record, but I'm doing it on guitar instead of a farfisa organ. But outside of that, basically, I've eschewed pedals for the time being. Oh, I like that word, eschewed. Mm, yeah. yeah. Don't, hear that. Don't hear that too often. <laughs> um, New York Minute's got that one little guitar lick, you know, in New York Minute. Da, da, da. Uh-huh. That's so distinctive. And I hear your version of it with the band, and that lick is there. Sure. It's just, it's just such a big part of the song. Mm-hmm. But I start focusing in on that and the way that that was used. Right. Well, I always thought of that part as being like, if you remember the Chai Lights, the vocal group? I do. Ooh. That's how I kind yeah. of saw that line. Yeah. Being, and that is the way it is on Henley's record. Yeah. We had um, Take Six, the great vocal group from, from Texas, uh, come and sing on that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, the Shy Lights. Yeah. Oh, now we, now we could go into that mode, but we won't, uh-huh. which is great stuff. You know, the vocal groups of that era as well. Yes, you know? all that stuff. I grew up with all that. Yeah. So it was a big influence on me. You seem like you're an open book now. Are you listening to things now that are affecting you on that level? Well, not on that level. Of course, you, you stay with what you grew up with, yes. mostly. I think this is true for all of us. Mm-hmm. You love what you grew up with. That's, that's uh, what you're drawn to. Do I, I still listen to music, and I'm, I'm always looking for stuff that I think is great, that appeals to me. Uh, I don't hear too much of it, but a lot of it is, you know, it's terrific, I think. You know, you, you want me to name some groups I like? I like yeah. uh, uh, the War on Drugs. That's one guy, uh-huh. Uh-huh. but yeah. I, I dig the, the sound they make. Um, Passion Pit, which is all synthesized, is also one guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of bands are just one guy, you know, and then he hires people to go on the road with him. So it's not really a band sound, is it? Well, it's different. Another guy I love is uh, Fantastic Negrito from mm-hmm. Oakland, California, mm-hmm. fan, which is wonderful. I love him. And Red, Raphael Sadiq is great. I, I, I love his stuff. Uh, I don't know who else. Let me see. Gary Clark Jr. is very, very good. Yeah. Uh, so there's stuff I'm hearing also. Jacob Collier is a genius, absolute genius. And uh, so there's guys that are, you know, super talented. Another thing is that uh, guitar players are like way better than they were back in the day because they've learned from YouTube. They're, you know, you run into, you know, 14 year old guys that can just play rings around me and everybody else. Uh, having said that, you also have to know how to play songs, though. And that's something you, it, that's much harder to learn than, well, not harder to learn, I won't say, but a different different to learn than, than uh, uh, shredding, for instance. You know, it's a different skill. If somebody wanted to listen to music, which is recorded, which is accessible to them, mm-hmm. to really kind of get the essence of your playing, what mm-hmm. would you recommend that they listen to? Oh, boy. Uh, well, the, the Henley Records, to yeah. some degree... Uh, some of the stuff is no one's ever heard. I had a band when I was in, in uh, Connecticut, me and a pal of mine, a guy named Charlie Carp, who's a really fine lead guitar player. Him and I started making records together under the name Slow Leak. And uh, they never went anywhere, and of course, no one ever heard them, but there's a lot of great stuff on there. And, uh, you know, that's very indicative of my style and how I think. But, of course, no one ever heard it. <laughs> so uh, it's a different situation. But it seems to have arrived in some ways kind of fully fully formed mm, how you do you mean know? i mean you you've had i mean you your sound your sound has evolved obviously over time but mm, yes. but but you know you came in with a real statement i mean you came in with a signature sound you see i wasn't i wasn't aware of it at the time like i said mm-hmm. i was influenced by all this different yeah. stuff by soul music and and by rock and roll at, uh, simultaneously and blues all at the same time yeah so it's just an amalgam of all that stuff that's my playing do you hear people who play like you do i hear people that play like me yeah um, not too much at, at this point. Mm-hmm. I hear people that I play like, <laughs> people that I stole from, you know. Yeah. But uh, I always love Mike Mike Bloomfield, for instance. His playing on those Dylan records is fabulous. Jimi Hendrix, who put together blues and that soul music style together, which no one has done before or after, and that's what made him great. Yeah. And uh, you know the um, the blues heroes don't do that. Jimmy is the only guy that could do it. Could really put together those elements, and that's what made him completely unique. So I loved him. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course, me and everyone else. Yes, of course, of course. The Bloomfield reference is interesting. Yeah, well, listen to uh, Bloomfield on those uh, Dylan records. Yeah. I love what he's playing. His parts yeah. are terrific. They're really great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's always this, the thought of being a team guy, Danny, of, right. of being fitting into a mode or, a, you know, you, as, as great as people are, they have to be team players, right? Right. Well, that's how I see myself, absolutely. Yeah. And what I play is based on who I'm playing with and what song I'm playing and what music I'm playing. Yeah. And I adjust to that. So uh, uh, my style is dependent on what, you know, what I'm play- who I'm playing with and yeah. what I'm playing. Yeah. It seems to have sustained you magnificently. Well, I love it. And, you know, you don't quit when you're, when you're a musician. Generally speaking, you don't quit. You can't quit, you know. Nobody I know, everyone I know feels that way. They just keep playing and playing and playing and playing. Sometimes you get paid a lot of money. Sometimes you get, don't get, get paid any money. But you always play. Always keep playing. Amen. Amen. Danny, I see great equipment around here and mm-hmm. great things. Uh, I, I believe you have a relationship with Roland and Boss. Well, I do. They've been wonderful to me. And uh, it's just a great partnership with them. And I use the, uh, the Roland Blues Cube Artist Amplifier, which I love. It's a great, great uh, amp. Um, Skunk Baxter helped design it, and it's just, it's great. You know, I'm, I'm really thrilled with that, that unit. And uh, they're just a great team, and they've been very good to me, and I'm very appreciative of Roland Boss and their, uh, all their help. Mm-hmm. Good sounds. So, Danny, you have a couple stereophonic questions, Certainly. if you'd be so kind. Obviously, you came to music very early in your journey. Um, if you didn't do music, is there an alternative... <laughs> diversive path you would have taken no <laughs> there was no plan b there was no way there wasn't only one, the one thing i ever wanted to do was play was play the guitar play rock and roll that's all i ever wanted to do and there was no plan b i was never going to give up or turn back or go into any other field it never occurred to me nice mm-hmm. nice and is there a holy grail guitar that you have never been able to find that that would fulfill your collection uh, not really. You know, guitars are like monkey wrenches. I mean, you, you get attached to them. It's a tool. It's just a tool. Yeah. And uh, great guitar players can pick up any guitar and sound like them. You give um, Eric Clapton any guitar, and he'll sound like Eric Clapton. Yeah. And that's, the same is true. Um, I like cheap guitars, you know, uh, sometimes like harmonies and Ks. They're great. I don't have too many of those, but uh, um, there's no holy grail guitar. And, you know, there's no way in the world I'd pay 70 or 80 grand for a a 59 less pull or 120 grand. Forget it. I couldn't, couldn't care less, you know, Yeah. about that stuff. Guitar, like I said, it's meant to be taken on stage and used. Now, a lot of guys, you know, dentists and lawyers buy these expensive guitars and hang them on the wall. I get that. That's fine. That ain't me. They're, they're to be used. Mm. Yeah. I see James Brown here. Mm. Big picture of James Brown. You've mentioned classic R&B as being something which was a big influence. And is that something generational as well that other people that you have worked with is that a common thread well i guess people my age because aren't mm-hmm. you know soul music was so great and important and wonderful you know back in in the 60s every record that, that stacksville put out was terrific every record motown every record they put out was great blue note records every record they put out was terrific and uh that stuff it just envelops you and i think everyone my age everyone that grew up with that music is in, has been influenced by it for sure Danny Kortchmar, you just make me want to go home and listen to a bunch of music, huh. most of which you've made. Mm. Thank you so much for being our guest. Well, my pleasure, absolutely. You've been listening to Storyophonic, a regular podcast series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. We come to you from Datalite Studios in Los Angeles, California. Our show is produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasic. Our production manager is Kim Strand, and our theme music is by Dusty Gray. Please rate us on your favorite podcast platform, catch up with our past episodes, and visit us often for new shows. I'm your host, Dan Kimpel.